Diana, Jim. All right. Good evening. The meeting will come to order. Call the roll, please. Uh, Mrs. De Silva. Here. Mrs. Gillis. Here. Mr. Melody. Here. Mrs. Rigby. Here. And Mr. Valentine. Here. Pledge of Allegiance. Dr. Marshalson. Mrs. Pallone. Approval of the regular minutes. Is there a motion? So moved. Moved by Mrs. De Silva. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Melody. Questions or comments on the October 9th, 2023 regular meeting minutes? Call the roll, please. Mrs. De Silva? Yes. Mr. Melody? Yes. Mrs. Rigby? Yes. Mrs. Gillis? Yes. And Mr. Valentine? Yes. Motion passes 5 to 0. Approval of the regular work session minutes for the October 24th, 2023 meeting. Is there a motion? So moved. Moved by Mrs. Rigby. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Gillis. Questions or comments? Call the roll, please. Mrs. Rigby? Yes. Mrs. Gillis? Yes. Mrs. De Silva? Yes. Sorry. Mr. Melody? Yes. And Mr. Valentine. Yes. Motion passes 5 to 0. <coughs> Approval of the agenda for this evening's meeting. Is there a motion? So moved. Moved by Mr. Melody. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Gillis. Call the roll, please. Mr. Melody? Yes. Mrs. Gillis? Yes. Mrs. De Silva? Yes. Mrs. Rigby? Yes. And Mr. Valentine? Yes. Motion passes 5 to 0. Uh, Dr. Marshallson, before we turn it over to you, I believe. I saw somewhere. I, I want to make sure that I recognize uh, board member elect uh, Mrs. Amy Messick is here in the audience uh, this evening and just wanted to congratulate her. And uh, she's got uh, a lot of work ahead, but she, Amy, if you want to raise your hand, <laughs> I think everyone's staring at you, but uh, none, nonetheless, I want to make sure that we welcome you this evening. Congratulations again. Dr. Marshausen. For our Golden Shamrock Award, uh, Mr. Boney, if you would step to the podium, please. Good evening, members of the board. Uh, typically at this time, I introduce Ed Putnaki, but he is not here right now, so I'm gonna ask Dr. Jen Schwanke uh, to help me here with the presentation of awards. Um, so the Golden Shamrock Awards were founded by Mr. Putnaki in 1990 to recognize staff members who have made noteworthy, outstanding contributions to our district. 
And in that vein, I'm going to introduce Sean Ritter and ask him if he could say a few words about our first award winner tonight. Thank you, Brian. Dr. Marshhausen, Mr. Valentine, members of the board and the community, my name is Sean Ritter, as Brian shared, and I serve as the principal at Bailey Elementary. Tonight, I have the honor and privilege of presenting Tracy Guerin, an intervention specialist at Bailey Elementary with the Golden Shamrock Award. Tracy's passion for student learning, her commitment to her craft, and her dedication to building trusting relationships with her students and parents is truly what sets her apart from other professionals. The impact of Tracy's work is felt across our entire district as she was nominated by both staff and parents within our community, and I'd like to share some of those submissions with you now. Tracy is an outstanding educator. Her experience as a general education teacher, combined with her years of serving as an IS, gives her a unique perspective when designing services and supports for students with disabilities. Tracy has helped improve our district in countless ways. She shares ideas, volunteers for leadership roles, and provides critical feedback when new resources and initiatives are introduced. Tracy taught both of my children at Bailey Elementary. My kids are two very different learners, and Tracy was amazing for both of them. She grew them intellectually, but most importantly, she fostered a love of learning and community in her classroom. My children sh share very fond memories of their second grade year because of Tracy Guerin. And finally, Tracy goes above and beyond each and every day to support not only her students, but all of the students within Bailey. She also communicates regularly with teachers in the building to make sure that shared students are receiving the support that they need. She's truly a phenomenal educator, and we're so lucky to not only have her be part of our Bailey team, but part of the Dublin, the Dublin team. Tracy, on behalf of the Bailey community, congratulations on this very well-deserved award. Okay, so I'd rather be out there than up here. Um, but I just want to thank the board, the administration, my friends and family um, for taking the time to acknowledge me. When you receive an award like this, you can't help but pause and reflect upon how you arrived here. Um, as I think about my career, I know tonight would not have been possible without the endless support from my husband and children and probably too many trips to the local drive through for dinner. Um, but additionally, I'm very grateful for our district, our community, our parents, and most importantly, my students and my colleagues. They have always encouraged me to be more and do more than I have ever thought possible. I have learned so much from the students I'm blessed to teach and from the staff I'm proud to stand next to. Ultimately, when I think about this award and being part of the Dublin City Schools, everyone in our community, our district, and in this room tonight has just one goal. We all want to raise endless fields of golden shamrocks who can successfully walk on their chosen path for life. I am grateful I have played a small part in their journey and I humbly thank you. And now at this time, it's my honor to introduce Dr. Jamie Stewart, and she's going to say a few words about our second and final Shamrock winner, Golden Shamrock winner this month. All right, Dr. Marshhausen, Mr. Kern, and members of the board, thank you for having us here tonight to honor Mr. Jason Parsons. Jason is our teaching and learning coach at Davis. Uh, there are not enough words to describe the positive impact and effect that he has on our school. His work makes our school a better place. If I took the time to read to you all of the submissions that were made nominating him for the Golden Shamrock, we'd be adding about 30 minutes uh, to this meeting. So instead, I just thought I'd share a few of my favorite highlights. Jason is friendly, approachable, and supportive. He goes above and beyond for the staff and students at Davis every single day. He's always willing to try something new and does so with enthusiasm and positivity. He's the most patient, kind, helpful, fantastic coworker. He's one of the unsung heroes at Davis Middle School. He works as hard as I've ever seen to make sure everyone gets all the help they need. He has built resources for the staff, sends out weekly tips for teachers to use in their class, 
And beyond the professional development that he does in the classroom, once a month he provides additional professional development for our staff. Terms that describe Jason include patient guidance, hands-on support, teaching and empowerment, consistent availability, and unflappable demeanor. He's a miracle worker. He has the best attitude. He's always cheerful and looks for the silver lining in, in all situations. The bottom line is Jason is a rock star. He's the kind of person who sees the problems before they occur and then works to fix it. He's always ready and available when there's a question or a problem and he does so with a smile on his face. He's also a huge advocate for all of the students and staff in the building and can be seen at numerous events supporting every club and activity. Jason Parsons is Davis Middle School and a true Golden Shamrock. And I think Lindy Schweitzer has a quick message as well. Dr. Marchausen, Mr. Valentine, members of the board. Um, Mr. Valentine, I'm actually here to give you a little bit of props on behalf of Jason. About five and a half years ago, I was presenting to the board at the end of the school year on instructional technology and what we were doing um, in the middle schools and high schools. And when I got to the part about getting all of our teachers Google certified and that we had middle school coaches rotating three of them between four schools, you simply looked around to your board members and said, would it be easier for you if we had one in each school? And I said, that would be amazing. Kind of walked away going, okay, maybe. And the very next morning, the curriculum director came to my desk and said, you can hire another coach. It made a huge difference in the next year and two years, especially going to, into the pandemic. Um, so I want to thank you for listening and seeing what we were doing in our schools and seeing the need for yet another person. I spend every Tuesday with Jason at Davis and I'm here to tell you he is so deserving of this award. This man runs around and never sits down, helps everyone that comes in his path, no matter if it's a student or a teacher, and I'm very proud of him. Congratulations, Jason. The unflappable part is about to be tested here. Um, first, I want to thank everyone here for the tireless and often thankless job of getting out into the community and getting people to support our schools. Um, I hope you know how much we appreciate it. I often say that this job is cheating. Um, people come to me for help, and I help them. Uh, then they thank me profusely on Fridays in the Davis shoutouts. They heap praise on me with the enthusiasm that's usually reserved for someone who delivered a baby in an elevator. Um, and I think that's a testament to how appreciative and wonderful our staff is. Um, thank you to the rest of our coaching team for their hard work behind the scenes, Lindy for bringing me on, and my family for keeping me grounded. Lastly, I have to thank the other teachers and principals for modeling how to go that extra mile and treat people the right way. Uh, from Dr. Stewart at Davis to Scott Burry in Lancaster years ago, I want to thank you for setting that example. Thank you, and remember to live the Irish way. If you plan on leaving, now is a good time. <laughs> yeah. All right. Moving on to presentations, Tools Career and Technical Center update. Okay, the uh, November report for Tools Career Tech is, is attached. Just a couple of items to call out. Uh, number one, the uh, grant that I've been talking about for the last several months that was submitted to the state of Ohio for a couple of additional high bay welding labs. Uh, 
We did not, we were not successful in receiving that grant from the state of Ohio. Uh, the state decided to invest in other career tech um, grants and initiatives. So tonight, after I leave here, I'm actually going to the tolls uh, board meeting. And one of the big things on the agenda is uh, kind of deciding on the next steps of the master plan. Now that we know this is not good news, but now that we have, have the news, we, we can decide what to do with the budget we have allocated for facilities. Uh, tolls has been working with Fanning and Howie for about the past year to come up with a punch list of initiatives for um, bringing the facility up to date. Uh, it is a 50 year old facility for the most part. Uh, so we are going to uh, decide what the next steps are in that master plan and how to address it. And the other item to call out, um, just there is a pretty detailed update on the uh, tolls satellite programs that are provided by Dublin schools. So just uh, when you read that, if you have any questions, feel free to let me know. Thank you. All right, moving on to public participation. There's nobody signed up this evening. Board President, Board of Education comments. Any committee reports this evening? Yes, I do. Um, I wasn't quick enough though. I have one question, uh, Scott, about the tolls numbers. When, when you look at the monthly enrollment snapshot and it says down at the bottom, it says peak enrollment reflects the total number in each program who attended tolls at least one day. And the peak enrollment and withdrawal numbers on this report don't reflect 77 who applied, were accepted, and enrolled. So my question is, I know there's a lot of shifting that goes on in the summer months, but these students were applied, accepted, and enrolled. Does tolls then go back to, or is it too late? Because I know there's a waiting list on, on a number of the programs, and I'm just wondering what happens with those 77 spots. Is it just... I, I believe that you know once the program is filled, it, it's filled, and students that were on the wait list are basically not eligible. That they're enrolled in their home school at that point. You know the the withdrawals from tolls. It might be week one, or it might be week three or four that the the students decide that they want to withdraw from that program. So, so I don't believe that there's the opportunity to then reach out to someone on the wait list and let them into the program. Okay. I was just wondering, because 77 is kind of a high number, and so it would yeah, be well, nice if... if I, I will validate that tonight at the board meeting and, and provide you additional information if okay. it's different. Okay. Um, and then going forward next year, if there is an opportunity to, you know, if someone withdraws in that first week, maybe there is that opportunity to, okay. to lock someone Great. in. Great. Thank yeah. you. Um, just an update on stack meetings yesterday. Um, just a, a couple of highlights from it. We, we were talking about um, the levy and what the levy means going forward um, and, and what we can see in terms of efficiency changes and scheduling will be a big part of that. Um, it, it was mentioned that, you know, second and third choices for students may become a reality and um, that will just mean that we're more efficient and hopefully students will get what they're looking to, the courses that they're looking to take, but they may not get their first or second choice um, and that's just something that we're gonna have to work through. Um, professional development days, um, the, the one common theme that I heard from that is the teachers would like more teacher voice to help plan in professional development days, and they all really resoundingly um, prefer to have the safety professional development at the beginning of the year, um, because they said that's really helpful. Um, and then Infinite Campus, I thought it was a Scioto, um, one of the Scioto teachers brought up the fact that there are some infinite campus kind of experts within their building, and so that was really good feedback because hopefully those people will be utilized to make infinite campus everything that it can be. And that's it. I have a couple. Um, the first one is the um, OSBA Legislative uh, Delegate Assembly. Uh, first, I want to just extend my condolences to the Tuskegee Valley community and everyone that was affected by the tragic accident on Tuesday. Um, on Monday, we held the um, annual business meeting for the OSBA Delegate Assembly. Um, there were guest speakers, including Governor Mike DeWine, who spoke about the, the state's literacy initiative and the science of reading. Uh, Dr. J. Christopher Woolard, who is the interim superintendent of public instruction. Um, he talked about literacy, accelerating learning, career readiness, and wellness. He also spoke about addressing absenteeism. 
Uh, Mark Lowry, who is the 2024 Teacher of the Year, spoke about the importance of building relationships and supporting teachers to do the work that they're meant to do. Uh, during the business portion of the meeting, the legislative platform was amended on lines 191 through 197. Um, and I can read that for you. It's a short this time, unlike a lot of other uh, meetings. Uh, it was amended to state that the OSB, OSBA supports leg legislation that allows students with disabilities on an IEP who have met all graduation requirements and who wish to continue their education, defer their diploma to count as a graduate using the graduation rate formula for their school and district. Uh, allow students with disabilities, disabilities on an IEP who continue their education, defer their diploma to maintain all supports provided by federal law. So that passed almost unanim unanimously, so it wasn't um, the debate that we have been accustomed to over the last couple of years. And then also, um, I attended the Citer C Senior Citizen Advisory Council uh, meeting yesterday, and we got to hear a beautiful musical performance from the Jerome Vocal Chamber, Chamber Ensemble. Um, it's very beautiful. Uh, Mindy Bazo gave a presentation on the English Learner Program. Miss Lori Marple gave a presentation on early literacy. And Dr. Marshallson gave an update uh, to the members, and they were able to ask their questions about the levy and other topics and share comments. And we had a policy committee meeting in October, but we can talk about policies when we get to that. And then I'll just do a quick uh, equity committee update. Um, feels like a lifetime ago that meeting was, but I think it was only a couple weeks. Um, uh, went really well. Um, we did a uh, deep dive into what district belonging, equity, and engagement council and how that is set up in our district. Uh, we talked a lot about uh, positive behavioral intervention support and how it works with equity in our schools. Um, in case anyone wasn't aware, uh, we talked where to find our religious calendar and our Better Together calendar, which are both on our district website. Um, and what I thought was a really neat feature is how we could link that to our personal calendars, which I found helpful. But um, most importantly, we broke out into four small groups, which was a different structure than usual and I thought very helpful. Um, very productive conversation on what we are doing, uh, concerns, what we could be doing better. Um, we had a very uh, high focus on high school and how we can be better connecting students. So uh, great dialogue, uh, looking forward to the next one. Uh, not really a committee update, but from an operations standpoint, I just wanted to have, have a shout out that I think Kaufman looks fantastic. The, the skin on the building, the exterior work, I mean, it just looks like a, a brand new building. So well done. All right. There being no other committee reports, we do not have anybody here for student rep this evening. All right, moving on to Mr. Kern. Um, before I get up and start with the five-year presentation real quick, just other agenda items here. We do have some appropriation changes. Um, DEF had uh, some grant awards, two, uh, teacher grant awards. Uh, we're continuing to get in uh, more from the Ohio STEM Learning Network uh, grants and a safeties and security increase here for a state grant. Um, we also have the junior, the annual junior varsity hockey reimbursement agreement. Um, this time it is just Jerome is the only one feeling a JV team. And so essentially what this is, is a reimbursement for two coaches um, for the JV team at uh, Jerome. And we have uh, the October 31st uh, financial report. I do want to point out this is, I went ahead and tied it to the f financial uh, five-year forecast that I'm presenting tonight. So um, so the budget or the estimates first actual uh, are using uh, the estimates that we have developed as part of this forecast presenting tonight. Sorry, I was a little presumptuous and ahead of myself there, but um, went ahead and did that. Um, we have one uh, student activity purpose clause and we have some donations to Davis Middle School uh, for various items there. So 
there's not any questions on those other items, um, I'll go ahead and get started with the five-year presentation if everyone's okay with that. I don't know, I'm old school. I like to stand up at the podium and continue to do that. So um, there we go. Just the same thing I typically repeat every time just to make sure we're all on the same page here. Um, high revised code and how administrative codes requires us to at least uh, twice a year uh, to have the Board of Education uh, pass the five-year forecast by November 30th and May 31st of each fiscal year and uh, to file with the Ohio Department of Education. Um, so this is the May update. And really, what's the purpose of the five-year forecast? Again, it, it is, it's a planning tool, um, discussions for all the stakeholders involved, uh, whether it be the Board of Education, uh, cabinet level, other administrators, uh, teachers, uh, classified staff, and so forth. It is our uh, long-range financial planning tool uh, that we have. Um, it's also a way, like I mentioned, we have to file with um, the Department of Education, or now do, I guess, um, uh, is the acronym to use now. Um, but if we think, uh, we thank our voters and their support of the district, the levy. Um, but as far as that filing is, um, if we would have showed a negative uh, in the third year, uh, we would have had to continue, we would have had, they would potentially to be in uh, fiscal uh, caution. And so um, we would have had to show, uh, like remember we, uh, we were out Jerome High School, um, talking about uh, possible re uh, reductions if the levy would have uh, failed. So uh, that's one of the reasons, another I reason to do it, but it's also a statutory reason to do it, but in there is follow-up. Um, it's just like it goes anywhere. People do look at it and review this and go forward from there. Um, there again, it's a snapshot in time as of today. Um, something could happen tomorrow that, that could uh, drastically change the forecast. I, I hope not. Uh, if it is, it's hoping the positive, but um, from that standpoint, but um, it's with the information we have at this time, as with any forecast and any planning and budgeting, and as you go out in the forecast, um, the accuracy is going to be a little harder uh, to uh, work on it and predict, but uh, we feel we have a good, solid, conservative uh, estimates and our assumptions, and that reads right into the third bullet point there. If you look at our notes, it's about a 19-page document. It's not, not just the face with all the numbers on it, but the notes uh, that talks about some of the assumptions that we have uh, in the forecast um, in there. So that's kind of a, another important part of the read, and that's something else we have to file, too, as well, along with the actual forecast itself with due. Um, Sorry, it's just so weird to, to say that, but I, I apologize. But, um, and it also then, too, is it looks, it identifies, and like I said, it's a planning tool, identifies areas. Um, we talk about, uh, you know, one of the slides that you always see for me is number of days cash balance, um, where are we getting at the end of our levy cycle and, you know, and stuff. And it looks at those challenges as we go forward, but it also allows us to be um, proactive and, Mrs. Rigby, you talked about efficiencies, right? And, and so this forecast is we're represent that for it, some of those efficiencies um, kind of build in uh, to the forecast with that and um, the challenge and roll up the sleeves that we have to do as uh, management here for the district. Two sections, we got revenues and expenditures is easy. Um, as you know, our main source of fundings is, uh, is local and state funding, but predominantly 85% um, or 82, 83% is from local taxpayers. And then salaries and benefits, um, uh, purchase services. And when I say purchase services, uh, utilities falls in that area. Um, uh, Subservices that we purchase from the ESC of Central Ohio. And then you have uh, the supplies and materials. Updates that we have. Uh, we. Um, we incorporated uh, the passage of issue 12 uh, into this forecast. So we have a positive cash balance through the end of the forecast, uh, which if you recall uh, last year, uh, also one reminder on the update in November every year, we roll forward one more year. Um, so this year, the final year of the forecast is June 30th, 2028. Um, we do have a positive cash balance just barely through June 30th, 2028. But 
um, just some things on there uh, as we incorporated the, the additional uh, implementation of the fair school funding plan for everybody else plan, I, sh I should say, not for us necessarily as Dublin City Schools. Um, but we did get a little, a little bump, but not significant in that sense. 15% um, uh, of our revenue comes from the state, and really that also includes the state share uh, of uh, local property taxes is now the new line that we're required to call it, um, which is the rollback in Homestead um, that is in there. And uh, two things that we're watching um, that are out there is we're, as you know, we're going through reappraisal and we've talked about that all over, over and over again, but um, there is legislation out there um, that could change that. Um, it looks like where it is heading is, I, I think, a very positive one is the expansion uh, of the homestead uh, exemption for our seniors. Um, and I, I think that is people who are typically more on the fixed income uh, and with that are seeing some increases. This is the, the expansion of the home homestead exemption, I think, is where they're heading. So, um, uh, but otherwise, the bills in itself talked about the way they calculate reappraisal and so forth. Um, has uh, would change in how they calculate it and actually be on a lower basis. Um, and our collections, uh, this is another thing we look at, our holding strong. Um, we've been fortunate uh, in this district. Uh, they've always held strong, even through, uh, we saw a, a little small dip uh, during the Great Recession um, in that time, but typically we're around 99% of collections. So uh, that's always good news for us since we're so locally funded. The graph that you see many, many, many times, uh, this was one of our facts uh, graphs uh, that you've seen as part of our levy fact uh, uh, information nights. And, uh, but this has been updated. And, um, and so it shows the new revenues in there. And as you can see, the, I do want to point out um, this line right there. When I first looked at this, um, when I was re reviewing it again, looking at it, I'm like, oh, shoot, that's the zero line, and now we're going under. That's not right. That is actually the 60-day uh, cash balance. And if, if you recall, um, uh, GFOA, which is a national organization, uh, recommends between 30 to 60 days cash reserves uh, kind of at the end of your uh, levy cycle. So um, as you can see, that's the 60-day range right there. Um, through fiscal year 27, we're there. Uh, we dip below it as we go into uh, fiscal year 28. We're still on that on the black side um, of that zero there, but uh, just barely with that. But the, everything's incorporated. Um, as you can see, uh, the light green uh, kind of uh, there, as you can see, uh, the, the slight increase due to the passage of the levy and collection. Uh, but then, as we've talked about many times, House Bill 920 um, kind of keeps that revenue flat uh, as, as we go forward for the most part as we continue to have expenses. So um, that's that line, uh, for example. Revenue sources, there again, um, we've I hit it on this a couple times already. Um, and I, I think we'll see one thing uh, that we're still continuing to monitor is House Bill 126 that was passed. Um, Previous, uh, previous year, um, which is talking about commercial and border revision and board of tax appeals cases, um, and us being able to get um, settlements, uh, direct payment settlements, instead of going through the process and how that has changed and that is no longer allowed. Um, that was significant uh, of an average there. It's two mills that we were receiving. Um, and so it's one thing that we're monitoring. I, one of the things that we did see um, this uh, collection site or this calendar year collection site, um, we did see a big bump in refunds in Franklin County. And we believe that is to House Bill 126 and settling of some of those cases um, and how that happened, that those payments were made back to those people. So we're going to continue to monitor those um, to make sure uh, our projections on tax revenue, as, as it being so relevant to what we do and so predominant, um, it's something we always have an eye on. Fair school funding plan to everyone else uh, is continuing. It makes us essentially a guarantee district. Uh, it's been a case for a while, and we don't see that going to foreseeable future. Um, what you have seen in this budget or in this forecast is for fiscal this year, fiscal year 24, and next year. 
uh, the current biennium budget. Um, you see those estimated, uh, what we're supposed to get in those plans. And then going forward, you'll see a flat, um, uh, flat flattening out of those revenues as we continue to go. Um, one of the things that's kind of funny, you see, you see a, a, a bigger increase here um, in fiscal year 24, but then we drop down in um, fiscal year 25. And you may ask, why would you do that? Um, way, the way they calculate um, uh, the f funding formula is one of the components is property wealth and your property valuation. Um, of course, there's income wealth is, is another one along with the students and the makeup of your students uh, that you have. Um, but as, uh, as it goes down next year is a portion of it, this is where the reappraisal and the effect of that and the increased valuation, lack of a better word, penalizes us as we go forward um, into the next year. So they see that taking effect and, and then essentially deduct that from what we're getting because they think we're getting this windfall. Um, and you guys, we've talked about many, many times, we're not through House Bill 920. So that's just a part of the formula. I mentioned 187 and 153 there. We're just seeing the, the, those impacts. And I, I just previously talked about 126 on the slide before that. Expenses. Um, and this is when we're, we're talking about efficiency. Um, is, you know, it, it's going to have to be in the salaries and benefits area. Um, as 85% of what we do is in that area. It's people, we're a service industry. Um, you know, one, for example, we, one of the positive effects that we've had um, for this forecast that's been implemented is uh, come January 1, our medical insurance premiums did not increase. They remain flat, so that is a, a big help um, to the bottom line there. Um, but other things is as far as we're going forward, on things as far as a very important part of it and what we do is we have our uh, current uh, negotiated agreements with both classified and certified staff and those have been implemented in there. Uh, but we also have what's called a staffing plan. Uh, we have different areas uh, such as growth um, and need uh, in different areas also in whether it be special ed. Um, in this case, uh, we do have factored in there the opening of elementary 15. Um, and, and so forth as we're going forward. But as we, even though we continue to grow um, with student population, uh, are, are trying to be more efficient. And, and I know uh, Dr. Marshhausen has, has, there was a report that has been done um, talking about if staffing efficiencies is to continue to do that and try not to um, maybe add as many staff or maintain what we're doing, even though with the increased enrollment continue what we continue to do and be, be able to meet the needs uh, of every student in this district. So um, that's our charge and we're going forward and this reflects that change that you would have seen in some of that staffing um, increases that we had in the May forecast we've, um, uh, we've taken out in this forecast. So uh, lack of a better word, challenge is on uh, to make sure that happens. Ending cash balance slide. Um, this is the one that we talk about as we look forward there. Uh, we're in that 50-day range in 27. Um, we got about a half a day, if even that, on uh, 28 there. Um, but as you can see, that's typically uh, of districts that rely on the local, prop uh, local property owners and local property taxes. Um, this is kind of the cycle of cash balances uh, as we go forward. So um, that's kind of where we're at. Um, in conclusion, Positive balance again through FY28, uh, state budget process, uh, provide little, little or new, new money. Um, f uh, we have two budgets, uh, actually that are, yes, two new budgets that will be implemented in biennium budgets in this forecast. Um, ESSER funds, uh, that helped us uh, in many ways. Uh, one of the uh, 95 phonics in our implementation of reading stuff was one of the ones we used that for. Um, but one of the big ones that really helped out our general fund is our one-to-one -one in the middle school and high school areas uh, is we were able, to, instead of using general fund, using ESSER funds to be able to use a lot of that for those Chromebooks. So um, that has been very helpful. But those are, that is gone after this next fall. Um, it has to be spent by that point. So um, anyways, and then we talked about Steve staffing plan to be the key driver. I, I, I've mentioned that several times. Um, 
uh, growth of students continues to add pressure on the resources during the foreseeable future. Um, that's why we talk about efficiency to meet that growing students, but yet be very effective in what we do. Um, and at some point, uh, we're, we'll have to report, return to the taxpayers. Um, that is just the way that the life in us uh, uh, happens uh, as a school district, but we'll, we'll still continue. I, I mean, uh, one of the things uh, we talk about is we'll still continue to lobby our local legislators. Um, we have our work with our associations, uh, whether it's BASA, OASBO, OSBA, to help in our districts um, and stuff. But also the thing too is we gotta keep an eye out for, and this is a stuff from a fact standpoint that kinda came up during the levy, is growth um, and tax incentives. And to make sure we'll continue those conversations, but um, there is limit what we can do, um, as some stuff is in law that allows them to kinda do it without our approval. But we'll continue that dialogue and those conversations, but also, uh, continue to, uh, for example, put pressure on them um, and let our public know what, what is going on there in, in their areas and for, so those people can hear from their constituents um, when it comes to that. So that's one thing we'll just continue to keep an eye on with that stuff. So is there any questions on the five-year? It's recommended by the Treasurer of the Board of Education to approve items 6B, 6C, 6D, 6E, 6F, and 6G. Is there a motion? So moved. Moved by Mrs. De Silva. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Rigby. Call the roll, please. Mrs. De Silva? Yes. Mrs. Rigby? Yes. Mr. Melody? Yes. Mrs. Gillis? Yes. And Mr. Valentine? Yes. Motion passes 5 to 0. Mr. Melody is going to be doing double duty for us this evening as he jumps over to tolls. So I want to make sure and give you a chance to exit as you uh, Thank jump you. here. Moving on to superintendent's report. Thank you, Mr. Valentine. Uh, just a couple quick things this evening. Um, we've had several questions about the timeline now that the levy uh, appears to have passed. It will be officially certified on Monday, November 27th. We are still above the margin that would be a mandatory recount. So we're confident that it will be certified on the 27th. Um, our timeline moving forward, we've started conversations as Mr. Kern has shared in his five-year forecast with our team on what staffing levels will need to be for the next four years, which leads to our scheduling efficiencies. As we implement the uh, comprehensive staffing audit that was done and seek to be more effective and efficient in what we do in our classrooms. So that scheduling uh, starts immediately when you hear in a little bit from Mrs. Marple about uh, our course handbooks and the work that we'll be doing with our course handbooks. Um, we understand that this is a little bit rushed now, but we were waiting because we had two course handbooks ready. Uh, we had course handbooks ready if the levy was approved and course handbooks ready if it had been rejected. Um, so those handbooks are there for your review today, which allow us to continue to offer the robust courses and options that we have for our students, but to do it in a way that improves efficiency. We will also be planning for a groundbreaking in the spring for elementary 15 and our preschools. Uh, as Mr. Stark will share in a little bit, uh, those packages will be ready in December for your approval of some of the first packages that go there. Uh, we are on path for both the elementary and preschool to open in August of 2025. There will be no redistricting done as we enter the 24-25 school year. 
our attendance boundaries will remain for the next school year as they are right now. We will be about this time during the next school year looking at the initial maps for what things will look like when we open elementary 15, when we redistribute students in that northwest quadrant. We had conversations with our teachers yesterday at Stack and with our principals today that we're going to be holding on up at Abraham Depp Elementary and at Glacier Ridge Elementary. It, it's going to be a little crowded next year, but rather than moving kids around for one year and then moving them around again when the new elementary opens, uh, we can do anything for a year, so we'll hold on next year. Um, our friends at Eversol will help with some of the overflow that we'll need to handle uh, at DEP next year. But those maps next year will start the process in the fall by January of 2025. We will have the new maps ready and finalized uh, for new elementary attendance boundaries in the Northwest and sh some shifts that will have to take place in our middle schools. Uh, all of those little ones who are elementary students do grow up and they will all try to go to Eversol and that's not gonna work. So we'll have to do that Highland Croy shuffle and, and readjust some of our middle school boundaries. At the same time, we will be working to start all of the other projects that were part of the bond. Uh, we'll be doing turf on football fields at Scioto and Jerome in the short term. We'll be doing playgrounds in the short term. We'll be getting on Riverside's HVAC system. We have electric to be done at Davis. We have roof to be done at Cells. All of these, sorry, Jeff's telling me, roof to be done at Davis, electric to be done at Cells. Uh, all of these other projects that will get going. And it's going to take about two years for us to be able to get to everything that was part of this process as we prepare with both new buildings and prepa prepare to maintain uh, our other facilities. We are incredibly grateful for the support of our community and also incredibly mindful that a win by 0.51% is not a mandate. Uh, I was asked last night at our, yesterday, at our Senior Advisory Council, how do you respond to the nearly 50% of the people and their concerns who voted against the levy? And, and I think many of the concerns of the people who voted against the levy are also shared by people who, grew, who voted for the levy. And when we talk about, we reflect on this and what did we learn? Um, myself and Mr. Kern and members of our team were in dozens and dozens of living rooms and meetings. And there were three things that really stood out in those conversations. Uh, there is a universal concern about unregulated residential growth in the Dublin school community. Um, we've always dealt with growth in Dublin. In about a year, we're gonna celebrate the 30th anniversary of Scioto High School and the 30th birthday it's that Scioto opened in 95. For some people, that doesn't seem like that long ago. Uh, and since then, we've opened Jerome and put an addition on Jerome, and we've always dealt with growth. There's a feeling, even from people who have been here for their entire lives, that right now it's unregulated and uncontrolled. Um, there's also great concerns about tax incentives and tax breaks that are given to the developers. Um, when we look at things like the apartment unit that's coming out of the ground at the old athletic club at Sawmill and the fact that that's 100% abatement for 15 years, that gives people pause. Um, so we're going to, as a school district, continue to work with our municipalities, but have more public conversations with our municipal partners as we look at growth and what growth means. We know that growth does not pay for all of the students that come to our schools, and thus we all continue to pay more uh, in response to this growth. As Mr. Kern mentioned, there are also misunderstandings and concerns about school funding. When the average school district gets back 85 cents for every dollar they send to Columbus in income tax, and we get back 13 cents, 
that raises concerns. We will have another budget cycle, another biennial budget. Uh, the Speaker of the House right now is looking at school funding and what that means for property taxes. We're going to need to continue to be active and continue to find partners in this work. Uh, we're not alone. Our friends in Olentangy will be on the ballot in March. Uh, between the two of us, we, we've got an awful lot of voters. So we're going to have to really mobilize and start talking at a different level about school funding in the state of Ohio. And then finally, as, been, as has been mentioned a couple times, we also need to tighten our belts. Um, before we could ever go back and ask our voters again for another levy, which our goal is four or five years from now, um, we're going to have to have a pretty comprehensive list of the steps that we've taken uh, to make sure that we've stretched every dollar between this levy and that next one. And we've said over and over, uh, we're 85 percent salary and benefits. And that was a lot of our education and conversations with voters as we talked during this levy cycle. Um, we're going to have to do better, we're going to have to be better, and we're going to have to be creative as we improve efficiency. Uh, the blessing of the levy passing is we have time to implement the changes in the audit and do it in a very respectful, intentional, and purposeful way. And our commitment to our board with the approval of the five-year forecast tonight uh, and to our community and to our teachers is that we will be thoughtful and intentional in, in the decisions that we make moving forward. So we have, a, we have a lot of work to do and we're excited and eager to get to work as we make this our reality as we move forward. As Mr. Valentine said, congratulations uh, Mr. Valentine, for your re-election, uh, Mrs. Messick, to your election. Uh, we have a formal onboarding process so that our new board members, uh, for the three of you who were elected at the last cycle, uh, you get elected and then it's the organizational meeting and you're just running. So uh, we're going to be ready to go be off and running. Uh, members of the board, you have a tentative uh, board meeting calendar for 2024 uh, with you. Uh, we share that calendar so that uh, if there are family events, vacation plans, things that you know are going to be on that calendar next year, if we can adjust the calendar at all so that it can be five of us, five of you in attendance will do that. We start to look at committee assignments. We start to look at leadership. Um, and get prepared for the 2024 board calendar. And we are also looking at a board retreat uh, in early 2024 as we review board goals, review Journey 2030, and set a course for this district for the next calendar year. Can I answer any questions or provide any information for the members of the board? There being none. We also have a first reading for policies. Um, I believe Mrs. De Silva, uh, you wanted to give some updates on those. Uh, yes, uh, I will try to make it quick since there are a lot of them. Um, so the first one, conflict of interest, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, policy, a lot of these are just bill updates, statutory updates, policy 2623.02 uh, is a budget bill update, policy 3120.08 and 41.20.08 are also uh, statutory updates uh, for a training requirement. Policy 5113.01 uh, makes the definition of parent specific to, to um, the revised code. Policy 5320 is changes based on the budget bill. Uh, policy 5337 is a new policy. Policy 6700 is a change to ref uh, reflect the law. Policy 8210 was cleaned up and added new uh, law for online hours. Policy 8330 was a budget bill update. Policy 9160 
says that cash will be accepted at school affiliated events, which is now required by law. Policy 9211 states uh, that board members or employees will not manage uh, support organization funds. And policy 9270 is a HB 33 statute change. And I think that's all. Additional questions or comments? This is again the first reading, so we will have uh, additional um, opportunity at our next meeting in December. Okay. Reports from Department of Academics and Student Learning. Well, first I want to welcome our student reps. Um, we failed to tell them the meeting was at six, so this is not their fault. I think they're both mortified. So we may circle back around and give them a voice to give a report here in a moment. Uh, it, she's apologizing. I, Tell her, don't, it's not us. Okay, um, on the agenda tonight, I'm gonna quickly turn it over to Chris and Lori, but I did want to speak about one item that will need approval, and that is some work we're doing with Peter Kahn. You can see from the summary there that Peter Kahn works with the um, Spoken Word program, and he is um, going to Scioto High School to work with our juniors in English 3 and Honors English 3. The cost for his visit will actually be reimbursed by the ESC of Central Ohio using federal grant money. So we're approving it and then that money will come back to us. So with that said, I'm actually gonna turn it right over to Mrs. Marple. You have a lot to Thank say. Thank you, Dr. Schwanke. Uh, good evening. Um, I am new school, so I'm gonna sit here and uh, present tonight instead of going to the podium, if that's <laughs> okay. Um, Dr. Markhausen, President Valentine, Board of Education. I want to take a few minutes tonight to talk through some of the academic changes that are being proposed for a new school year. One of the big changes, um, we have called um, these documents our course handbooks for many, many years, but there's a little bit of confusion between the course handbook and the student handbook. So you'll notice that the, the title of both middle and high has shifted to uh, reflect academic programming um, and at high school pathways as well. So that's just uh, something of note. Um, really proud of my team and the work that they sh uh, did in preparing these documents for you. And after I go through the high school changes, I'll pause for questions about high school before we move into um, middle school changes as well. And in front of you, you have a document that outlines these changes in a little more detail for you. Um, so feel free to ask questions uh, as needed. So uh, I'll start with design enhancements and do I need to be advancing my own slides? Thank you. Um, the pathway focus, uh, you'll notice in our handbook in alignment with Journey 2030, really helping our students see how what we do aligns to pathways and how pathways actually broaden student experience uh, in our high schools versus narrow their options. Um, and then you'll also just notice some things like uh, digital navigation improvements. Um, there's actually two handbooks that I provided. One is a very printable flat copy, um, but the one that's linked into the board agenda uh, is, is hyperlinked so that you can really navigate freely, much like a website. Um, and so we're hopeful that will be more helpful to our students and our families. Um, and they can have uh, direct links even out to our website for things like our tools programs and our updated forms. Um, and that allowed us to shorten the book by directing people to our website for some of those critical pieces that are aligned to policy um, and information. Um, and then you'll just notice that our virtual courses are embedded with their in-person counterpart so that we're clear with our students where there's flexibility for that. Um, as far as content changes, I'm gonna start uh, with our IBCCP uh, pieces. So if for International Baccalaureate, to give you a little bit of background, over the last few years, um, Julie Blevins, our principal here at Emerald Campus and our IB team of teachers, have been very mindful of thinking about how can we increase our enrollment in our IB courses. Um, we've talked a lot tonight about tightening our belt and thinking about our programming. It's our goal to uh, maintain our IB programming in a way that we have full class sizes. Um, part of this work has been looking at area schools around us 
um, and coming to the realization that we had more course offerings in our IB program than most schools. Um, and that was one of the reasons that our class sizes were lower. Um, and in combination of looking at what we were offering and what else students have an opportunity to take, Julie looked at this and was able to help make recommendations with her team of which courses should be eliminated so that we can continue to have an IB diploma program so that we can be streamlined, most efficient, um, and still provide this great learning opportunity for our students. So you'll see that reflected. Um, the specific changes are some changes in our ab initio IB language offerings. Um, if you recall with the IB program, you have offerings in different um, cohorts and areas, and we, we want to keep offerings in all of those areas because that's how the students earn that IB diploma. Um, but our ab initio classes had very, very low enrollment because many of our students um, take other languages and then are able to advance into that higher piece. Um, and you'll see that there's some history changes and global politics, but there are additional courses um, that students can take. And as when I use the words phase out for any of those courses, what we're really saying is that the students who are currently sitting in year one will have the opportunity to go to year two um, and then uh, it, that course would phase out. In addition, you'll note that there's just some language that we changed around clarity of every AP course and IB course and CCP course to ensure that we have consistent language about what registration looks like, what kind of credits are attached, and offerings. With that said, um, you can see here on the screen that we have a few academy changes. Uh, a couple weeks ago, or a couple months ago now, uh, you got to hear uh, about our three new academy offerings. Um, there are a few additional updates. Most of those are changes that were initiated by tolls with the satellite programming that they uh, partner with us on here at Emerald Campus. And we tucked our bridge and our paths into our academy offerings, highlighting that those are programs that also are a part of the academy experience here at Emerald Campus. Um, prior practice has been to not have Mosaic and Zoo School in our course offering handbook. These are limited seat programs, um, but in a, in a spirit of transparency and wanting to make sure that our families have all of the information about what is available, those have been added this year. They're not new programs, though. We have spent time visioning around our virtual course offerings uh, in recent months. Uh, and you'll notice that we have removed AP uh, and honors virtual courses, limiting our year offerings um, to the standard level DCS virtual options. Just to remind the board, our virtual options are meant to provide flexibility for our students um, in their schedule. Many of our students uh, need that flexibility to take some of the specialized programming that they take. Um, and so you'll see those outlined as well. In addition, um, we're starting to talk about the credentials that are embedded in specific courses. Um, credentialing is very important uh, for our students' pathways and graduation planning. Uh, and it's our goal to have credentials embedded in curricular courses so that as our students progress through our different pathways, um, they earn those credentials automatically as part, so that it's part of their embedded learning. So in particular, we have two business classes that we are working with our teachers in the business department to train them, um, support them in getting the Rise Up credential into those two classes. And you may have seen recent legislation and shift around financial literacy. Um, Dublin's actually been a leader in this. We've had financial literacy for quite a few years, thanks to our Board of Education. Um, but the law has shifted for the class of 2026. So you will start to see over the next few years some of the language in our handbook change to align with the guidance at the state level. Um, that financial liter literacy class is going to have some restrictions about who can teach it and what department it can be in and how it's coded. Um, so we're wanting to start to socialize that um, with some of our younger students and make sure that, that we're setting students up 
for that predictable piece. Um, in the background, we'll be dealing with both sets of rules uh, with our counselors and customizing that experience as, as needed so that um, we're meeting the, the requirements of every individual class. Um, and then in the mathematics department, uh, you'll see two shifts. One is um, that College Board released an AP pre-calculus class with a beautiful standardized curriculum for pre-calculus. Um, that will replace what we have had, which is our honors pre-calculus. Not a huge change, um, but, a, but a slight change for some students. Um, and then we are adding a data science class. Um, data science is part of the state's initiative around algebra two equivalent pathway options for students. Um, in auditing our math courses at the high school, we have seven to nine calculus-based based options for students, and they're, they're well attended. We, we have our AP calculus, our IB courses that have calculus integrated and embedded within, and we also have College Credit Plus. Um, so this um, calculus option that's being removed to make room for that data science class is that regular calculus and it has lower enrollment than our others. Um, and we feel strongly that we have lots of options for students in that fifth math class, um, which is what calculus typically is for students. Um, and where we really are seeing a gap is uh, for our students who need that fourth math credit uh, for graduation. And data science is a growing field. Uh, it is an area that will be appealing to all of our students. It could live as a third map. To new territory. I mean, I, obviously there's crossover and many things I'm sure that are applicable, but um, wh what is that process? It's a great question because upskilling and reskilling our teachers is something that's starting to become norm um, as the world is changing quite rapidly. Um, Right now, uh, Christina Hutchison, curriculum coordinator, is working uh, with someone at the ESC. They actually have a training program for data science pathway, and so we're hoping that we can work closely with, another, with other districts to make sure that we have the right support for teachers so that they can learn the content and be prepared to teach. I have a, um, some comments and question. Um, first of all, thank you for all the work that you put in and your your team I love the new layout with the the way that it's organized I think it's easier to see you know the different groupings and everything thank you um, love the hyperlinks I haven't gone in and checked them all yet but I have Check used them. we've them. checked them 50 times yeah. so I hope I hope they're all good <laughs> yeah but I did use them to look at some of the course descriptions for IB and it's really convenient to have that embedded right into the document um, one question. Uh, also, thank you for explaining the IB courses and how all of that works, too. I think that's helpful for us and, and the public. Um, my question is around the honors virtual level classes. Mm -hmm. Was that typically lower enrollment in those courses? Yeah, yes, and actually some of them didn't run this year. Um, and, and we have the content for those courses. And so, you know, we'll have to decide, do we want to offer them in summer school? Do we want to hold for a little bit and see if there's a need? Um, as we go through, the way high school scheduling works is it, it student choice drives much of the scheduling. Um, and so I'll be curious to see how our virtual requests come in um, and what that will mean. Um, just because a course is presented to you doesn't mean it will have enough students to run, and that's been practice, you know, for a long time. Um, and sometimes that could mean that some courses can run at different times. One of the things um, that we have learned is that we are not, we don't have the infrastructure to be a complete online school. Um, that's just not the nature of how we are set up. And there's logistics like attendance and student support and intervention and the ability to move in and out of models that, that may or may not work for a student. And so we're being mindful of all of those things in making these decisions. Thank you. You're welcome. I d did we um, have online or virtual learning before COVID? I know we didn't run all of these classes. I just wasn't Great sure question. about that. We had just started down this path right before the pandemic. Okay, Yeah. okay. And then I know you talked a little bit about IB and comparing what we were doing, kind of like we had more classes, more lo looking at efficiency. Can you speak to the numbers of like 
where are we headed in terms of how many classes, what's an average, and where were we, just a number-wise, as far, as far as course offerings for IB? So all of the courses are in the handbook. Yeah. So, and you can see that... It was a lot. It, I mean, there were, it looks plentiful to me. It they're, looked, they're, uh, the th they have a lot fantastic. of IB offerings still. Um, and that's our, our goal is to meet the needs of our students, right? Um, while also thinking about how we can make sure that that classroom has enough kids for robust conversation, that the offerings are there for the IB diploma. Um, so you can see, I, I can't spout off those numbers. I could provide those for you afterwards. Okay, great. Um, and I can ask Julie to put together some more statistics if you're interested. Yeah. Just was curious about that, but this this has been so user friendly and really amazing, and I appreciate all the hard work you guys put into this. Thank you. I can tell you um, that our offerings in this 24-25 proposal is very much in line with other IB schools um, in all of the research that we have done. Just one more question on IB is. Um, is it still going to be an option for students to take IB courses without seeking the IB diploma? Yes, that's called certificate, okay. and that is an option. Okay, thank you. Yes. With that said, I'm going to shift um, to our middle level learners. Um, and I want to start, before I go into the, the details, there's some significant shifts in the middle school proposal, and so I want to start by talking about our why and our process. Um, for about five years, um, there's been rumblings that uh, we don't have a lot of choice for our students at middle school, and if you have a middle schooler, you might be aware of that. Um, and, and that's been a, a conversation that's been ongoing for many, many years in Dublin City Schools. Um, just prior to the pandemic, our principals and leadership at the time started looking at some data with the double block of our ELA, um, particularly at seventh grade. Um, and one of the things that the principals uncovered is that the difference in achievement and growth between double blocked seventh grade and single blocked eighth grade was a minimal difference. And that led to some questions um, about what's our why, what's most effective. Then a pandemic hit and there was a pause. Uh, and we had an opportunity a little over a year and a half ago to come back to those questions, um, come back to some of the previous work that had been done among our middle school teams with our teachers and our principals, um, some of whom are here still and some of whom are not. Um, and, at that s and then recently, we've had this NSK-12 audit that has told us the exact same thing, which is that research around that double block of ELA um, really has an insignificant effect on student growth and achievement because um, not all students may need that double block of ELA instruction. Some students may need more time in other areas. Um, oftentimes that's math and ELA. Um, and some students need, need a little less than others. And so our middle school principal team in partnership uh, with myself and Mike Allring have really been studying this, talking to our teachers, um, thinking about what our next steps in Dublin are. Um, how do we offer some choice to students? How do we honor this data? How do we be more efficient with our staff while offering choice? Um, and how do we also then consider research about middle schoolers and experiential learning, knowing that the middle level learner is primed for experiences and trying things that maybe um, they're not interested in, but they have the aptitude for. Um, and we've talked about some of that through STEM conversations and other things. And so everything that I will share tonight is a reflection of that process. Um, and, and there's been many stakeholder conversations uh, around each of these decisions and, and areas, um, both through curriculum reviews over the last few years um, and the current work with the middle school principals. Um, so with that said, you'll see some of the same aesthetic changes that you see um, in the high school, although it's, it's a little less complex at middle level. Um, I'm gonna start with seventh grade. Um, because seventh grade is where the most significant changes are for 24, 25. Sixth and eighth grade have very little shifts. Um, there's some name changes, um, but not a lot of content changes. 
Um, when, uh, so we would propose, you can stay on that slide, that we will unblock that seventh grade ELA. Um, and when you do that, um, that opens up a period in, in student schedule. So I will make sure I talk about how we're going to fill that. Um, you'll also notice across all three levels something um, called literacy and mathematics connections. We have literacy connections right now. We have places where students can get additional literacy support. Um, this is intended to broaden that support, to give that extra time and space for the students who need it um, in very purposeful ways at the middle level. Um, so that's what that connections piece is. Uh, it adds tier two and three support options and can be very flexible around the day, the needs, the trimesters, the A day, B day. Um, and our principals are prepared to think about the students and, and make that happen um, with database decisions at the middle school level. Um, you'll notice that COG Ed is replaced by something called creative mindsets. Um, and then in just a moment, when we go to the next slide, you'll see some new trimester options. But before we do that, um, let me just highlight quickly some of the changes you'll see at sixth and eighth grade. Um, at sixth grade, uh, we want all of our students to take our modern literacy class, not just some. Um, we have been improving that curriculum, and we think uh, there's lots that's changing in the world of digital literacy for students around AI and other things that they need to be aware of. This is where digital citizenship lives um, and their understanding of their own personal profile online and the safety behind that. Um, so you'll see that there. Um, and, then, and then the other changes that I also mentioned at seventh grade. At eighth grade, um, we currently have a year-long art eight option and a trimester art option. Um, we are renaming that eighth grade one. In Infinite Campus, it will be easier for, for us to have two different names. It makes it easier to pull up reports and classes. So that's just a, a clerical change, not a, not a course change. Um, and then our eighth grade STEM class uh, will now be called STEAM. It's always had design components in it. The A is for the arts. Um, and then medical detectives, you're going to see that on the, the options at seventh grade and eighth grade. We are currently piloting medical detectives in the eighth grade year long STEM class. It's a unit um, that they're doing this year. And the feedback from the middle school STEM teachers initially was that students taking that year long class, which is focused a lot on robotics and automation, um, didn't know they were signing up for medical detectives this year. And that's true because it was a pilot within. Um, we are hoping to pull that out of the year-long class so that that year-long class can still be focused on automation and robotics and so that students know that that medical detectives class is its own focused STEM option. That, all of these courses, um, the curriculum, it comes from Project Lead the Way. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity and support um, and grant money for teacher training and support. Um, and we already, we already did some of that training of those eighth grade STEM teachers this year. If you'll go to the next slide, here you'll see those seventh grade student options that will live as trimesters um, to give students some choice and opportunity. Um, Prepared for Success is a course focused on setting our students up for pathway understanding. We talk about interest and aptitude, um, but we need a place where students have an opportunity to really explore those things in a structured environment so that they're ready um, to think about what the world's like, what they are interested in, what they may be good at um, to help them. And so that would be at the seventh grade level. You'll see a couple literacy-based courses. Uh, you'll see a couple STEM-based courses. Um, Global Studies uh, is a course that would expose students to language and culture around the world um, to help them better make decisions about what language they might be interested in or whether a language is the right choice for them in eighth grade. Um, and then those art courses there are ones that are 
Uh, we have an art seven already in place. This is just separating it, separating it out into two, one for more two-dimensional art and one for three-dimensional art. Students have reported that just taking general art every year um, isn't as interesting. So when we think about what's next for middle school, should the board approve these options, um, we get an opportunity to think about that student experience, our efficiency, and how we're getting things done, um, and then decide, do we want to make more changes down the road with sixth grade and eighth grade? Um, we feel that by starting with seventh grade, um, it will allow us to make that tightening of the belt, make these decisions in a way that's manageable for our staff with curriculum development, teacher training, principal support, and other things. Any questions about middle school? <clears throat> I, so I e emailed uh, you on this yeah, one question I today, haven't. and I think it's <laughs> relative to, um, and I've got a couple to, to dovetail off of this, but as we make the change, and specific for seventh grade, and there's the uncoupling, it, I kind of outlined three different scenarios based off of my conversation with Dr. Marshausen today, and that was one, students can, will continue with um, the two periods if there's the need as you described, is, is that correct? So it won't be a back-to-back -back period, yeah. but there like are flexibility yep, components there will that be you options. talked about. And some of that support also can be flexible in, in what time of the day it looks like for different students, right? Okay. Some students may need it every day, mm -hmm. some may need it every other day, and some may need it for six weeks. Gotcha, and, and that's applicable with the math, uh, with that um, uncoupling of the, the periods yes. is applicable that's the, the goal. side. That's and the then goal. it clearly gives additional choices as, as we look here um, for students, whether or not they're, uh, I forget how you described it, but I'm going to say middle of the road uh, type uh, students or for students who are advanced and, and looking to, to obviously challenge themselves in, in other areas. Is that a fair assessment based off of what I, uh, or what I emailed you earlier? Yes, today? I would say <laughs> all students mm -hmm. have an opportunity to take these courses, okay. um, not just advanced students. That makes sense. And then my, similar to my question with the high school stuff, because there's even more courses here, and <laughs> how do we plan on or uh, attacking the teaching side of this and the training side of this? Uh, because there's obviously a number of different uh, areas that uh, are mm -hmm. very different uh, as well. Thank you for asking. Uh, anything with project lead the way next to it. Um, has a curriculum, so we'd be looking at what does that training look like, and we have plans in place for that. Um, as far as the others, uh, our, our curriculum coordinators and myself and the principals have a plan after the first of the year to pull some teams together um, per, to start building that curriculum. These are 12-week courses, um, so the building of the curriculum, it will be a big task, um, but my hope is that we would be back to you in the spring um, for approval of graded course of study um, of each of these these courses. Yep. I have a few questions. Um, most of them are around the Project Lead the Way courses. So how did you decide which ones to start with and which ones to pilot? Great question. So our STEM um, teachers have come together quite a few times over the last two years. Um, and we explored not just Project Lead the Way, but some other modules to deepen and innovate our STEM programming in the middle school. Um, as a part of that, and principals were involved in that as well, they ranked some of the things that they saw. Um, it didn't make sense to live in two different platforms, so they went with, the, they leaned towards Project Lead the Way versus one of the other uh, programs that we had seen. Um, and app creators and medical detectives both came from their preferences and also our data of what our students are saying they're interested in. Um, we've talked about this before, but our students in Dublin City Schools have very high interest in medical fields, but they often think all they can do is become a doctor or a nurse. <laughs> and the medical field is very, very much wider than that. Um, and so this is one way to address that student interest as well. And then it's a very popular class in, in um, other districts, and our teachers are just starting to teach it, and the kids are very excited about it. Yeah. I'm that's, excited. That's rumor. I'm excited, and so I don't get to learn it. But uh, <laughs> the other question I have around that also is, are there other um, 
project lead the way courses that you're looking at or that we're looking at or that students are interested in that might be added? I, that's an option down the road. Um, I think it's too early to say. I think I, I'd like to see all of these uh, pan out and, and ask our students what they think and ask our teachers what they think and determine how many teachers we can train and what we need. Um, but there's many, many options, um, both homegrown curriculum and, and something like that. And this is just kind of a, a, a side, but the technology that goes with these courses, mm -hmm. do we already, I assume we already have it. <laughs> so automation and robotics is what's embedded in our um, year-long STEM class, and we just upgraded some of their um, robot brains. Now I'm going to sound really geeky, but I kind of like it because I'm a math teacher. Um, we just updated their robot brains because the ones that they had had, had aged out and, and weren't updatable. Um, so we're working with our middle school teachers on, on those needs. We had actually, when we opened Eversol, we had a new teacher and she hadn't been trained in that so yet with the others years ago. And so she actually went and was trained um, this summer. Um, so we're really working to, to get all of that up to an equitable place and we'll continue to do that. That's just regular practice for us. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Any other questions? I just had a, a couple questions on the, um, sorry, on the um, seventh grade pre prepared for success. Will the students be exposed to all of our pathways during that? That's that? the hope. Okay. Um, and then my other question is you, you looked at achievement with the double block and you said you looked at, you know, from seventh to eighth grade. And I realized with all of your explanation why it's so important in sixth grade to have that double block for students, what is your anticipation of the, the students who will no longer need that double block? Or can you even kind of give me an idea or a guess? I'm, I'm just trying to figure out, you know, in, in terms of the need and the placement of, of these students and who's actually going to continue to need it. Let me, let me say two things. Um, many sixth grade schools across the state of Ohio have a single blocked sixth grade. So, you know, that, that'll, I'm sure, be a future conversation that we get to have. Um, with that said, um, that transition from fifth to sixth grade is a very important transition to watch with our learners because um, they go from that elementary schedule uh, that looks very different than that sixth grade schedule. And as you know, in some districts, sixth grade's tucked into elementary, and in some, it's more of that middle school model like ours. Um, I don't know that I can anticipate uh, how many will need more today, um, but I can tell you that some of our students will need support in both math and ELA. And that's where th that art of scheduling comes into play. Um, it's not always easy to like say, all these kids are getting extra literacy support, all of these students are getting extra math support, because in some cases, it will be very organic and need-based. Our elementary support is that way, so we know how to do this, because we have a model at elementary that works. Um, and the goal is having the proper staff and the training um, we have, when you unblock ELA, we know we'll have ELA teachers um, with this skill set that we can continue to, to support and upskill. Um, and I'm happy to provide that data once we start to see how students schedule. Students will initially schedule into that single block and then the buildings will use their MTSS process um, to look at their data and place students as needed in that additional support. Absolutely. You stole what I was going to ask, and it was exactly, I mean, your question to have into eventually that answer that you gave there. How, how the communication will work with um, families that fall in line with what you just said, how, how do you envision that process? Uh, I would working? imagine. Can I take it, that one? Can I take that one? Oh, sure. I, I'm just taking it because um, I feel like you need a drink of water. Yeah. <laughs> but also, um, Chris, I'm glad you asked that question about communication. That's going to going to be a heavy lift, right? This is a big change. We have asked our principals to take a lead on that. There's a lot of training, there's a lot of communication that's going to need to go on with their counselors because they're going to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with students and families, with their reading support teachers, with their ELA teachers. So they are going to develop a plan and make sure that communication happens. Um, as you all well know, 
we will communicate and over communicate and there will still be some confusions and there will still be some questions undoubtedly put on social media <laughs> that we will address like we always do calmly and consistently and clearly. So we'll see. Um, I'm sure there will be bumps, but I think we're ready. Lori, would you change anything or add to what I said? No. no. My, my last thing is uh, going from two to one. Is there any concern with the standards that were covered in the time of two classes to then predominantly one, depending upon the scenarios? Did you know I was just going through and circling the questions I hadn't gotten to? <laughs> and that was one of them. Um, our graded course of study is designed after the state standards, which assumes students are only in ELA for a period. We know we can do this because we do it in grades eight through 12. What will shift is our teacher's mindsets. I'm certain there's some anxiety around how do I fit it all in. Um, but one of the things we have to also start thinking about with our literacy and ELA instruction is that literacy and ELA learning is so important, it has to be owned by across all disciplines, um, not just in that space. Um, so when the student leaves their ELA block and goes and works with a literacy support teacher, that's also ELA instruction. When a student is doing nonfiction reading in a science class, um, that's also supporting their ELA instruction. It's not necessarily you know, ELA focused standards, but it should be supporting. So how we support our readers and writers through multiple disciplines, and middle school is the time where that starts to become a little more integrated for students, and then so that by high school, they can write and read um, in, in, in much more professional ways. And I would add too, this is not new to Dublin City Schools, we had a blocked um, language arts um, before 2001, then we unblocked. And what happened, Craig, you remember, don't you? <laughs> um, I spent more than half my time in Dublin City Schools at the middle school, so I can speak in detail about this. And what I will tell you is when you shift away from a block, science teachers, social studies teachers, they all have to kind of pick up the literacy load a little bit. So in social studies, we may have a longer writing assignment than we would had before. And ideally, we've got some collaboration between those teachers. So um, we know it can be done because that's how it was built to be done in one period. So it may sh shift the pace of how the instruction is delivered. It may shift um, our differentiation. Some students that read faster, write faster, and move faster will have a different experience. So I think we feel good about it, but we know there's gonna be a lot of um, questions like that. We're thrilled that you're asking them so we can publicly articulate them and we we ask you to keep them coming because when if you're asking, if you're wondering, so are other people and we'd like to address them publicly. I guess I have a follow-up. I know we got that 25 minute uh, block of, of time that's used at the middle school for various um, purposes or, or reasons. Is, was there any consideration given to changing that dynamic um, and as, if, as far as time is concerned? That's a great question too, Chris. Just on Wednesday, I asked uh, Mr. Ulring to dig into that question. That's a lot of instructional time. And I asked him to look into the student experience, the teacher experience, the parent experience, and um, what we need is a data measure. And by that I mean our intention for that 25 minute block, are we meeting that intention? <laughs> and if so, how do we know if it's working? So I think um, that's an excellent question as well and we're looking into it. I hope to have a report for you um, in the spring. There's a lot of ways we can go with that. We can continue to improve that period. We could um, move it to less frequency um, I think there's no doubt that there's value to having an advisor connection to our middle schoolers, but we have to make sure it's being done authentically, consistently, and with fidelity with a goal in mind. Um, so yes, and stay tuned. With no other questions, I believe Mr. Andres, you're going to um, have some information to share at another, uh, a forthcoming board meeting, but you wanted to offer time for questions, right? No, we're good. We're good, okay. <laughs> then we're going to give Maria the microphone. Sorry, Maria. Don't worry, I can actually speak up too. Oh, 
girl, I'm giving you the microphone. You wait long enough. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for having us here today. Um, I know was, there was a bit of a confusion, but. <laughs> Um, so I want to start off with Emerald today since we have an exciting day tomorrow with Discovery Day. So each year we host a Discovery Day to provide students to learn more about any outside of the box beyond the classroom topics that we normally wouldn't learn in our day-to-day -day routine of going to school. For example, there's a bunch of marketing, um, some dance options I believe available. My Chinese class is personally doing a few dumpling courses too. The IB program at Emerald Campus is also hosting a sock fundraiser to support the Water Changes Everything project, which funds water projects in Africa. And the media marketing students were able to visit this shoe touring the press box and facilities with one lucky student even getting to announce over the stadium's uh, PA students. For Kaufman, the Kaufman Med Club put on a blood drive in collaboration with the American Red Cross. And their student council hosted a free thrift store for all students in the high school, primarily stocked through student and staff donations. For Scioto, they have hosted their 10th annual Veteran Story event in collaboration with the Scioto Purple Star, Star Club to recognize veterans within our community. This was an incredible opportunity for sophomore social studies students and made over 200 poster presentations honoring our veterans by telling their stories. Students and attendees also attended multiple military roundtables to speak with veterans about their experiences in the service. For Jerome, our district multicultural clubs hosted Diwali celebrations, preparing lunch and dancing during lunch last Friday. And our theater performance of Chitty Chitty Bang Bang will premiere this weekend. And this is a special premiere because we have worked with the Ronald McDonald House Charities Foundation to donate items needed for families of children receiving medical care. And this is a campaign that's gonna be running throughout the entire month of November. Now this last piece of uh, announcement that I'd like to give is something that I've talked before on for the uh, license plate initiative that Mrs. Benny, Dr. Marshausen, and really the entire board has given us the opportunity to do where a group of us students from Jerome, specifically our AP government class, has been granted the opportunity to create a legislative bill to initiate a license plate that would be district sponsored. And so far, we've been doing this since um, last October, and we we're still doing this now, but last, uh, yesterday actually, we had our first Senate hearing. So we were able to provide testimony, me and three other students who are still engaged in this project, were able to go down to the State House at 10 a.m. It felt very weird not being in school, but we were able to provide our testimony. It was a great experience to not only draft what we were gonna say, but also kind of reflect on why did we really do this in the first place? And what was the impact of our actions and what we wanna get out of this experience? It was an amazing opportunity. Thank you to all of you for providing us with these programs um, and experiential learning to learn beyond the classroom as well. Mrs. Marple was announcing new middle school programs and high school programs available to continue our commitment of prepared for success. And when I think of Dublin City Schools, I also think of how you're preparing us for all sorts of experiences too. So thank you everyone for um, giving us the opportunity to learn within the classroom, outside of it. And thank you also for letting me speak tonight. So thank you. <laughs> Sending kids to the state house. That's what we do. Good job, Maria. Okay, if I take you clear back to the beginning, we do have something to vote on tonight. So, Mr. Kern, back to you. Um, yeah, I was going to say, we're going to the approval of the partnership. Is that where we are now? As we bounced around here. Yeah. It's recommended by, <coughs> excuse me, it's recommended by the superintendent, the Board of Education, approve a partnership for service with Peter Kahn. Is there a motion? So moved. Moved by Mrs. Rigby. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. De Silva. Questions or comments? <coughs> Call the roll, please. Mrs. Rigby? Yes. Mrs. De Silva? Yes. Mrs. Gillis? Yes. And Mr. Valentine? Yes. Motion passes 4 to 0. Mr. Stark, Department of Operations. Good evening, everyone. I just have one item for your approval tonight, and that is we're recommending. Uh, to purchase eight new 72-passenger buses and one new 66-passenger bus 
uh, for about $1.2 million. This allows us to maintain, we're trying to keep the bus fleet every 12 years to flip the entire bus fleet. And uh, I'm happy to report that but with this purchase, if approved by the board tonight, our oldest buses in the fleet will be from 2009. And just seven years ago, we had buses much, much older than that. And these are uh, key to us because they're under warranty, keeps the buses safe, and it says the most precious cargo we have uh, every day traveling back and forth. Any question? And this was uh, from the Meta bid that the board approved in August. <coughs> Meta does a large bid on this competitively, and we're able to share with that bid. Any questions? All right. There being none, it's recommended by the superintendent, the Board of Education, approve the attached resolution authorizing the 2023 bus purchases. Is there a motion? So moved. Moved by Mrs. De Silva. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Gillis. Call the roll, please. Mrs. De Silva. Yes. Mrs. Gillis? Yes. Mrs. Rigby? Yes. And Mr. Valentine? Yes. Motion passes 420. Human Resources. Okay. Good evening, members of the board. Um, tonight's agenda, just um, we've got a few retirements on. Um, November is typically the time in our certified area where we see lots of retirements. And so if it's okay, I'd like to just at least honor a few of our folks that are um, retiring at the end of the school year. Um, so I'll just mention their name, where they're at, and then their years of service. So on our list tonight, so Christy Andrews, who works here um, at Dublin Teacher Academy, will retire with 29 years in our district. Cheryl Angel at Eversol Run, Social Studies, 13 years. Kim Frank, Scioto High School, English Language Arts teacher, 26 years. Uh, Pamela Halen, second grade teacher at Glacier Ridge, 38 years in the district. Uh, Todd Hardesty, math support teacher at Scioto High School, 35 years. Carl Johnson, Academic Skills Center at Scioto High School, 35 years. Nancy Moore, fifth grade at Deer Run, 28 years. Susan Morgan, second grade at Old Sawmill, 38 years. Janice Onken, Social Studies at Davis, eight years in the district. Roger Raybould, Biomedical Teacher at Emerald Campus, 32 years. Jim Roscoe, Science Teacher at Scioto High School, 23 years. And then Amy Whipple, third grade teacher at Old Sawmill, 38 years. I said to Donna O'Connor today, I said, um, so my math nerdiness, I said there's like 340 years of expertise leaving our district at the end of this year, so we wish each of them just the very best and thank them for their service. Also in the certified agenda, you'll see a change around six period pay along with <coughs> resignation just of a few of our pupil activity permits. And then the supplementals that are on tonight cover athletics and then building and student leadership. The pupil activity contracts are focused around athletics, and then there's one that's on for choir. Moving on to our classified agenda, you'll see the first item is a job description for a position that doesn't currently exist, but we're using the headcount from one of our retirees on tonight's agenda to fill this. Um, so I'll mention that in just a second. There are six resignations and three retirements on our classified section. Um, again, and those folks are Carol Harrington, who's going to retire from Chapman Elementary as a paraprofessional with 20 years in our district. Jane McCullough, that's the position that we're um, going to fill with the, uh, the new um, position that's on for your approval from our enrollment office with 19 years in the district. And then Tammy Yoder from Carr Middle School has 30 years in the district. And we wish the three of them just the very best in retirement as well. There are eight new hires on tonight, along with a handful of salary changes and then four staff members um, that are on for unpaid leave. The final section is for stipends, and you'll see three of them on. The first one is for the Ohio Department of Education dyslexia models uh, that were offered. This does go back to summer of 2023. It was required professional development. Um, so this is on to make sure those individuals um, are compensated for that. The second is English language arts resource training for fourth and fifth grade uh, <coughs> teachers for core 95 phonics training. And then the last is the Scioto High School ELA uh, project stipend um, that was mentioned earlier um, as well. And that concludes the HR portion tonight. Any questions or comments? All right, there being that it's recommended by the superintendent, the Board of Education approve items 13A, 13B, and 13C. Is there a motion? So moved. Moved by Mrs. De Silva. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Rigby. Call the roll, please. Mrs. De Silva? Yes. Mrs. Rigby? 
Mrs. Gillis? Yes. And Mr. Valentine? Yes, motion passes four to zero. Reports from communications. Good evening. Um, so I just wanna share a little bit about um, a, on November 7th, um, it's not just the teachers that go through professional development. Um, we held our, what we believe to be the first session of across the district PD for our administrative and building secretaries and clerical staff um, that morning. And so we covered with them um, stuff that kind of helps us support um, communications. We really truly consider um, those individuals an extension of our communications team and we shared that with them um, because they are oftentimes the first initial point of contact for families at our building and they are also um, the most common point of contact. Um, they're the ones that are answering the questions, they're the first smile that they see uh, many times um, during the school day and um, they really build a connection with our families that's different um, from what our teachers and um, administrators do. And so we wanted to spend time really sharing with them and showing our value to them. Um, we called it Directors of First Impressions PD because to us that's what they are is Directors of First Impressions. Um, and we spent a lot of time not just sharing with them things that we um, felt they needed to um, maybe learn or understand better about our apartment, um, but also um, it was really like a lot, there was a lot of two-way communication. Um, and I learned some things from them that I didn't know. Um, and just because it was the first time in my year of being here um, that I had been in a room with many of them. Um, and it was very helpful to me to help guide our strategic communication work as we move forward. Um, for example, I didn't realize that many of them have never had training in school messenger or how to put together a message um, that's appropriate and, and will be impactful and meaningful to our families. And so I recognize that that's a need. Um, they shared that with me. They seemed hungry to learn, which was um, exciting. Um, and uh, they were um, afterwards very appreciative and shared um, some feedback with us that they really appreciated that we took the time to um, teach them some things that they have really needed and wanted and been craving and just haven't received. Um, we also have started on our website, on, on the staff intranet, a support staff communications training portal. And so we're filling that with as many resources um, as we are able to, to try to, again, help support um, learning and improving their um, work experience in the, in the front offices of the buildings. So. The um, second thing I'd like to share tonight is that all 24 of our building websites now have the new theme applied. So if you'll remember back in December um, and at the start of the year when we changed our logo, we changed the district website to the new theme, but it was still a process of going through and changing all 24 buildings. Um, it takes anywhere from eight to 12 hours to change a website theme. And so when you have 24 of them, um, some of them it's a little bit more, some of them is a little bit less depending on um, what they needed. So it was a heavy lift for our team. Um, we had started the process in early summer and then kind of had to quickly switch gears when we decided to go into um, navigating the levy communications. And so for us, um, I, we completed this about a week after the levy. Um, so last week, and oh, I guess this is kind of a week, but right shortly after the levy and it was very exciting to finally say, we have finished this project because I've had a lot of anxiety about the fact that we've had to put it off and put it off. And so for it to be done in the buildings to have the new theme applied and their websites to be a um, means of more effective communication to their families was really important. And then I just um, wanna share with you what's trending for the last 30 days in the month of November. Um, so on Facebook, our top three posts, um, the first one was Halloween. We uh, posted, all of our staff in various costumes throughout the district and um, actually had a call to action on that post, um, which is something we don't often do, but we thought let's see if this uh, pushes our engagement up and it did. Um, so we asked families to vote for their favorite costume by putting a thumbs up in the comments and it worked. We got tons of engagement. Um, actually, I think it's currently in our top three for the full calendar year at this point because of the level of engagement. So um, that was an interesting trial for us. Uh, the second one is PD Day. 
Um, we posted lots of pictures from November 7th to show the hard work that our teachers and our staff were doing on PD Day. And then the third one was the thank you to our community for um, what appears to be them accept, accepting the levy at this point. And then on Instagram, which again is our, our student platform uh, where we have lots of students, uh, the first one was the levy. Um, I thought that was interesting since that was third on Facebook, um, but students seemed to really respond and react um, to the fact that the levy was accepted. And so um, I think that shows that that meant something to students, that this community responded in that way um, and that they're able to keep enjoying the student learning experience that they get here in Dublin City Schools. Um, the second one was Veterans Day. Um, we shared a lot of pictures of our students with, with their uh, veterans that they had in for breakfast or um, choir concerts and things like that. And then the third was the Washington DC trip. So we've been posting all the middle schools as they've been going to DC and people have enjoyed seeing that. Okay. Do you have any questions? All right, thank you. All right, items for board discussion or future agenda items. We have one more meeting left for this calendar year. All right, if there is nothing else, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. moved by Mrs. DeSorla, second by Mrs. Rigby. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes four to zero. We are adjourned. Thank you.